switch now to uh, another, after the microbiome, new area of great interest, right? To what we call the metabolism in the tumor microenvironment. So we know that uh, immune cells and tumor cells compete for nutrients uh, in the glucose and so on, and also for oxygen in the tumor microenvironment. So this is a great source uh, of uh, you know, uh, understanding for us uh, on the mechanism impeding or enhancing immune response and also a potential uh, uh, source of information to uh, uh, design new trials uh, in, uh, going in the same direction, trying to improve uh, current therapy of uh, melanoma. So uh, the effort in terms of uh, the understanding of the metabolism in melanoma in melanoma immunotherapy is led by Dr. Da Dr. Yana Nadja uh, in the melanoma program, and uh, Yana is going to uh, talk to us about that today, modulating hypoxia in immunotherapy resistant melanoma. Thank you, uh, Yana, Dr. Najjar. Thank you so much, Hassan, for the kind introduction. Great. I'm so sorry for the issue with my video. And it's such a pleasure to be invited uh, to speak today uh, as a member of the melanoma group. I wanted to give a special shout out because a patient of mine is admitted and I know they are watching from their hospital bed. So thank you. And today I'll be discussing um, a huge area of interest in my lab and my collaborator's lab, which is modulating hypoxia in immunotherapy resistant melanoma. Uh, these are my disclosures. I don't need to explain to this group the scope of the problem. Unfortunately, the incidence of melanoma has continued to drastically increase uh, in recent decades quite consistently. And when I was uh, in medical school and in training now years ago, the only option that we had to treat patients was chemotherapy, which really doesn't work very well. Uh, patients with stage four melanoma lived on average under one year. And we have made significant strides in recent years with immunotherapy as uh, my uh, partners have touched on first with uh, anti-CTLA-4 and then anti-PD-1, and most effectively with a combination of both, such that at five years out, over 50% of patients with stage four melanoma treated with ipilimumab and nivolumab are alive, which is really remarkable when you consider the rate at which all this has happened. However, that's unfortunately not true for all patients. And as Dr. Devar and Dr. Luke mentioned, there are two problems here. The first is so-called primary resistance, meaning patients who never respond to immunotherapy at all. And after that, you see this tail in the curve. And if you were to continue to look after this, we know that for patients treated with monotherapy, even those who have wonderful responses, after many, many months, and in some cases, many years, progression can still occur. And this is so-called acquired resistance. So between primary and acquired resistance, it is thought that up to 70% of patients may ultimately have um, lack of benefit from immunotherapy. So how can we extend the benefits of monotherapy to more patients? And this is really what myself and my partner spend all of our time thinking about. It's a huge area of interest. We have many agents that uh, work quite well in the frontline space, meaning at the first uh, treatment initiation. And there are many others that are under investigation, including uh, novel inhibitory targets, co-stimulatory modalities, which I would argue have not been quite as exciting so far. And we also are now trying to take a more holistic 360 approach, looking at the tumor itself, the tumor microenvironment, the host, as Dr. Devar so beautifully spoke on uh, in the microbiome, and even the peripheral blood. And what we have spent a lot of time thinking about is how the tumor microenvironment, and when I say that, I mean the tumor itself, what's inside the tumor and what's surrounding the tumor, might impact responses to immunotherapy. For the past uh, almost eight years now, we have been trying to biopsy every patient that we can, and we can't thank you enough for your generosity in our endeavors. We bring the melanoma cells to the lab, we passage them, we grow them, and then we run them on this nifty little machine called a seahorse. And the long and the short of it is that the seahorse allows us to see what kind of metabolism the melanoma tumor cells themselves depend on. 
And what we have found is that there is really significant heterogeneity between samples. There are some tumor cells that are depending heavily on oxygen utilization for their energy. This is what OCAR means, it's oxidative metabolism. And there are other tumor cells that are heavily dependent on ECAR or glycolytic metabolism. They depend more on glucose for their metabolism. And essentially no two are the same. So what, why is that important? We then looked at how the metabolism of the tumor cells themselves impacts the immune cells that are coming inside the tumor. So in an ideal world, when an immune cell sees a tumor cell, it should kill it just like it does when it sees a human cell that is infected with a cold virus. That's why most of us will not die of a cold, thankfully. But one of the fundamental questions we're all aiming to answer is why don't immune cells recognize cancer cells and get rid of them? And what we found is that the metabolism of the tumor cell has a significant impact on the function of these immune cells. In fact, the immune cells that we are taking out of tumors that are heavily dependent on oxygen for their metabolism don't work as well. These tumor cells are making, excuse me, these immune cells are making less of the good stuff like interferon gamma and TNF alpha, which helps them to kill tumor cells. On the other hand, when we ask ourselves whether the tumor cells that are more dependent on glycolytic metabolism have the same impact, the answer is no suggesting that specifically tumor cell oxidative metabolism is what impacts T cell or immune cell function. Does this correlate with clinical outcomes? The answer is yes. So the most important question we ask ourselves as oncologists is, what does this mean for how a patient is doing clinically? And we found that the progression-free survival, the overall survival, and the duration of response are significantly lower in patients whose tumor cells are heavily dependent on oxygen for their metabolism. We then evaluated levels of uh, hypoxia or low oxygen within the tumor from these same samples. And we found that the tumor samples coming from patients who are resistant to anti-PD-1, which you might know as um, nivolumab or pembrolizumab, had significantly more hypoxia within the tumor. This is measured by a certain stain. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's measured by a certain stain called CA9. This is a side project that has really been a pleasure to work on in collaboration with our bioinformatics core. Uh, I won't go into it in the interest of time, but briefly I will say that we have uh, performed in-depth hypoxia tumor and cellular profiling on over 150 samples. And we do see that there is increased hypoxia within um, tumor involved uh, lymph nodes specifically, suggesting that this is not just particular to the tumor, but also uh, areas of tissue that are involved with tumor. So we asked ourselves whether it is a tumor's ability to sequester oxygen that is linked to immunotherapy resistance. And as a tumor cell, grows, it essentially outgrows itself. So these tumor cells, billions and billions of them will turn into an actual tumor and it ends up cutting off its own oxygen supply because it cannot keep up. We are particularly interested in VEGF, which is a well-described uh, regulator of uh, development of blood vessels in the normal host and in tumor tissue. When we looked at patients who specifically had progressed on immunotherapy, we found that by and large at progression, most of those tumors were dependent on oxidative rather than glycolytic metabolism. Now, mind you, we don't know if that's correlative or causative, but it made us start to think about the fact that perhaps modulating hypoxia within the tumor microenvironment might be able to salvage patients who are no longer responding to immunotherapy in a way that we would hope. This isn't a very new idea. We have long looked at um, hypoxia within tumors and many other diseases. 
uh, famously renal cell carcinoma, where it's made a huge difference in treatment. In melanoma so far, this has not really panned out as well as we would have hoped. And we think part of this is the drugs that were used. So when very high doses of anti-vascular uh, drugs were used, we think it may end up actually exacerbating the problem because you're cutting off the blood supply entirely. And so we started to think about excitinib, which is already approved uh, in the interest of time. I will uh, skip through this, but it is approved for use with um, pembrolizumab in patients with kidney cancer. So we took this idea to the lab and we ended up treating mice that had melanoma with low versus high doses of this anti-VEGF drug, excitinib. And we found, as you can see in the middle panel, that when we treated the mice with low doses of excitinib, we were significantly reducing hypoxia or areas of low oxygen tension within the tumor. This was not true when we utilized high doses of excitinib in the right-hand panel. We then went back and looked at paired tissue samples from several patients. We had biopsies before they had started the treatment. This is pre in these figures. And we had biopsies from the same patients when they had progressed on anti-PD-1, meaning pembrolizumab or nivolumab. And we did see some variability in expression. Uh, importantly, we saw that VEGFR3 seems to be consistently overexpressed in patients at the time of resistance to anti-PD-1 blockade. We also saw, importantly, that VEGFR1 and VEGFR2 are expressed in these tumor cells, suggesting that there is a target that might make sense with excitinib. As is often done in clinical trials, you need proof of concept, uh, what's called preclinical rationale, before taking this into the clinic. And so we performed a series of experiments with uh, B16, which is a melanoma tumor model in mice, and MC38, which is a colon cancer model. And we essentially found that when we combined anti-PD-1 with excitinib in blue at the lower right-hand side, this seemed to work better than when we used either agent alone, suggesting that there was synergy there. I would also point out that B16 is a pretty notorious, unforgiving and aggressive tumor model. So we were excited to see that there were some responses. So this is a clinical trial that uh, with great support from my partners in the melanoma group, we have opened quite recently. Uh, based on the preclinical data we have generated, uh, some of which I have shared with you today, this is nivolumab and excitinib in patients who have progressed on anti-PD-1 monotherapy or patients who have progressed on anti-PD-1 with anti-CTLA-4 or ipilimumab. So essentially what we're trying to do here is deepen a response or resensitize the tumor to treatment with immunotherapy and excitinib in those who have stopped responding to their initial treatment. And this is all based on the hypothesis that by decreasing hypoxia in the tumor microenvironment, by using VEGF as a, a VEGF inhibitor, excitinib, we will hopefully be able to resensitize tumors to anti-PD-1 monotherapy. The eligibility criteria are such that patients must have received anti-PD-1 with or without CTLA-4, and they must have stopped progressing, uh, excuse me, they must have stopped responding to treatment. So this is a second line trial meaning when you see one of us in clinic, if we are meeting you and you have not yet had any treatment, this is not a study that we would discuss with you. But if unfortunately the treatment you are on is not working as well as your doctor might hope, this might be discussed with you. Patients will undergo biopsies at baseline with their staging scans, and then they will start treatment with both drugs concurrently with another biopsy at week 12. And you may receive treatment for up to two years. Like everything that we do here, and I speak for myself and all of my partners, there's a very heavy emphasis on uh, obtaining tissue, blood, and stool so that we can understand what is going on so that we can do better, so that more and more patients can respond because, of course, we're all trying to move the needle forward. And one novel thing in this clinical trial is the utilization of this drug called pimonidazole, uh, which is a long name for a drug that is given with no treatment intent, but they are pills that are given that allow us to see how oxygenation is occurring within the tumor. 
So if a patient takes pimonidazole and then they have a biopsy, we can see whether or not that area has low or high oxygen tension. Primary endpoint, as Corey had touched on, this means, uh, this asks the question, what's the whole fundamental question of the study? The fundamental question of the study is what is the overall response rate, meaning shrinkage of tumors in patients who have stopped responding to their prior line of treatment. We are also assessing the safety of the combination, which we expect will be very safe because pembrolizumab, as I mentioned, and excitinib are already approved in another indication, renal cell. We are looking at progression-free and overall survival. And uh, as I mentioned, we are obtaining a lot of tumor tissue, blood, and stool with, uh, in collaboration with Dr. Zarur and um, Devar to try and understand what the treatment is doing to modulate the uh, microbiome. So we opened up the study uh, weeks ago. We have treated nine patients so far. We have been able to obtain biopsies uh, pre and post on the majority of these patients. And um, the efficacy and correlative data are to follow. In the coming weeks, we're going to have our first cohort of patients undergoing their initial set of week 12 restaging scans. And of course, we are really eager to see what that will show. And uh, we are so hopeful that there will be some benefits. So in conclusion, I hope I've convinced you that the metabolism of tumor cells profoundly impacts the function of immune cells within the tumor microenvironment. None of these exist in a silo and it's a very dynamic and ever-changing place. We think that remodeling tumor cell metabolism, this is what you heard me talk about last year with metformin, which is another ongoing project, and uh, or remodeling hypoxia or oxygen within a tumor microenvironment may salvage responses to immunotherapy. We have many clinical trials ongoing in this vein with a heavy emphasis on the correlative or tissue, blood, and stool analyses. Uh, I really couldn't work with a better group, I think, anywhere in the world, and I would like to genuinely thank first and foremost our patients with their just unspeakable generosity as they enroll on clinical trials, of course, with hope of benefit, but of course, understanding that this is how we learn and we move the field forward. My physician collaborators, uh, my lab uh, members and my collaborators lab members, and of course, our um, many sources of funding. I thank you so much for listening uh, and I'm happy to take any questions.